going to be a, a workshop that can answer some of the, um, we'll tell you a little bit about some of those uh, different actions that we're going to do here in the I was also going to do a little bit on just on the kind of science, you know, I thought, well, we should have to do it, you know, we have the IPCC report in three, I mean, this year, and, you know, maybe I, maybe I, you know, maybe it would be useful, but I think we all know what the IPCC report is, you know, we got three reports when we have last year in September, we looked at the kind of science, and basically the takeaway message is, you know, everything that we thought was going to happen is happening faster than we ever thought. So when people say, you know, climate change, you will be like, okay, two degrees maybe, and after that we, you know, start to get dangerous. No, all of the impacts that we thought were happening after two degrees are already happening at one degree. So part two degrees is not dangerous, it's catastrophic. It's the tipping point when we get to where we actually climate scientists are saying, we're not really be able to say it with, it, with any genuine accuracy about what that the impacts are going to be able to be. So for me, you know, the climate denial is of course the like the factor and they're always going to be there. There are always going to be, but the plan don't, the scientists get killed with. And as they will change their strategies, and we see that they're changing their strategies, some of them are going to go into climate denial now, they're not going to say, but the cost of it, now, you know, should we, should, is it better that we just, we just adapt to it, forget about trying to tackle why climate change is happening? Um, so that was the first report. And so the second report, that was in September, and we had the report in March, and looked at the impacts. And it talks about the environment that the, the loss of our ecosystem, the impact in terms of our food production, globally, the collapse of agriculture in Africa, you know, that will happen and will be hit or after 1.5 to 2 degrees. It means absolutely incredible on right across the scale. You know, everything that we survive on, people survive on, will be impacted. And then the, the, the report in, in April, which is about mitigation, what should we do? And basically said, we've got to uh, be made to trust. We better be rapidly decarbonising before 2020. That's, I mean, that's the time frame. We need to be starting. There's no, we can start in 2050. No, the target level will decarbonise in 2050. We need to be making the huge cuts right now. And then it said what we need to do, ultimately, change your energy system and change the way that we produce our food. And whilst this seems huge, we also know we've got real solutions on those. We've got real solutions on our energy transformation. We've got real solutions on our food production. We like it. We know. We know that we've got kind of cooling agriculture. It's called agroecology. It's based on small farmers. We know we can feed the world on that. We know that the industrial agro-business model is the model that's driving climate change and also dispossessing people and impoverishing people. We know our energy system so is, is creating the fuel poverty, uh, is exploiting and creating the extractive industries which are decimating our communities and our environment. We know we have clean energy now. We know we can invest in it and it can bring those benefits. So we know that's all out there. So then we have to come along. So why are we losing? You know, why are we not winning? And I think, and I want to just maybe spend a few moments in a, on, on that. I think there's some, um, I'm sorry, it's just a say. So, so, uh, um, <laughs> now I realise it's not a video, I thought it was on the last one. <laughs> I think the first mistake that many people Which is why when people go, well, 
you know, it's really hard. Why don't they come to a solution of these plans for the children? Because they're not. This is not about negotiating the horse over. About this. this is not about if they don't do this and do something else, it's just a technical solution and it's get all governments on board with women. No, this is a much, much deeper co com uh, debate. This is about transforming our economic system. This is about being able to understand that it's about our consumption and production models. And that's what's up for us today. And that's what's being negotiated. And that's what we're screaming. And that's a huge thing. That's what we've been fighting for from the levelers on, from the trade union movement for the last hundred years. And this fight is a fight on that, on that same trajectory. So that's the scale of what we're actually trying to do. So we should realise that when we talk about climate change, that it's not just a technical thing. And then the third thing that people think is that, uh, I mean, I know here in this room, and you say, well, how did people think that there was no vested interest against it? That there wasn't another side? That there wasn't an enemy that was building, had more money than we did, had more resources than we did, and was capturing government, you know, not at the UN Equitable Sea. They don't need to go to the UN Equitable Sea like we do. They catch them here at the, in, at the national level. They're catching government decisions. They decide and influence and lobby the government to make sure that the decisions that they make, that the positions that they're holding, that the, that the ambition that they're proposing is at the level that they deliver, that doesn't challenge their power. And we know why, as you said, the, the trillions are invested. We are, we're, we're living in London, you know, we're in the UK, we're the financial city. You know, it's built on our investments in the dirty energy and fossil fuels. So the power that we're talking about of those corporations is also meant to, we have to, we have to also know that we've got a powerful enemy. It's not, this is not that there is no enemy. There is a very, very powerful enemy. A powerful enemy that has built itself over time, over centuries, and is embedded in every part of our society and the control of our political system, our culture, our media, etc. They influence that. So we also need to know the scale of this thing. We need to be able to name our enemy. We need to be able to name it. So it's good that we're starting to name our enemies and say they're the big energy corporations, they're these kinds of corporations. Because that's the old bit of the problem, that was also one of our problems, I think. We talked about climate as if there was no enemy. And never was able to do so. What are we fighting for? Is it some, something abstract in the atmosphere? Is it invisible? I think the third thing was this incredible disease that we have <coughs> pragmatism, you know, of being, trying to be pragmatic. I always look around and say, our job, <laughs> our job is not to be the government, it's not to be negotiated, it's not to be saying, where is the government, and can we go a little bit on the right, left of them, and therefore that'll be a pragmatic decision, uh, demand, and then they'll move to that. Well, first of all, we just don't have time for that kind of thing. We don't have time for piecemeal, piecemeal, piecemeal. So, so our demands can't be pragmatic or, or, or during that level. So that means that we, are some, we have to have some real fight. And you've heard the fight. We've got to stop the cheating. We have to. In that, if we don't, we've lost. We've got to make sure that the EU's climate energy package for 2020 and 2030 is both ambitious. Uh, uh, and we've got to make sure that here in the UK, we've got some red lines and one of those red lines is stopping fracking. Without those things, we are done. You know, so those are real fights. So we can't be pragmatic about those we also need a movement, a movement that's strong enough, and one of those key issues is we need diversity of movement. Because, you know, the mistake again that people make, they have this theory of change, I mean, it's incredible. This theory of change is like, I always think it's like an elite theory of change. What it basically says is, you know, all of you are, and everybody out there in general society, you are really, your job is to give me more power, so when I walk into a room and I talk to a government, that they don't say, oh, they represent some set of people. And then we'll have this pragmatic conversation. And somehow it will go on climate change. You know? And that, therefore, basically wasn't interested in ensuring that there was a diversity of people. But what it looked at was like, who are the, who, who are the people that they're most interested in? Well, that's typically really affluent, white, middle class people. Therefore, you don't really need working class people to fuel, fuel poverty and all these issues. They don't, they don't in, interested. They're not important in how we try to tackle climate, <laughs> but they are. And I think, secondly, about our language and our demands. You know, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about climate change in the sense of saying it's like temperature levels and targets and all of those things. Hang on, unless you're a real team, 99% of the people are going to turn off on that. 
you can't build a movement around it. I would say you can't build a movement around a number unless you're 15 years old. But it's important that we actually have demand that people can respond and connect to. And that's why what we've got to be able to do in the process. And a whole process that's been happening as well is this idea of like making very, very clear, concrete people's minds. Coming up from the global side to our nation, we're saying it's about three different things. See, there's many, many things we've got to change, but three things that we can try and rally our movement around. One is around energy. We have to stop the inflation energy process. We have to stop our government handing to our taxpayer money to the inflation energy process. And we've got to support community power, community energy. Decentralised community energy systems, because not only do they transform our energy, but they're also the two billion people around the world who don't have any access to energy or can't afford access to energy, then are on our side. For the energy transformation that we deliver, they're not necessarily first. Their first issue isn't going to be climate change. The first issue is going to be that energy access. If we can bring that energy access, we can move forward. Then we've got food, because food people understand as well about impacts on food. You know about food, the right of food and the cost of food, and we get it. We know that those are two of the most pressing issues globally: food prices and drive our uh, drive more of our movement. Third is about people; it's about justice, about impact. And we've seen it here when there was a tragic flood, but in the series of tragedies in Miami, the Philippines, and the drought in the Sahara, it's about impact on people. People connect with people. You're absolutely right. We need to tell stories of people that people see how they are connected, what their struggle is connected to their thought struggle. And we need to be able to have a transition. So we have to recognise that there are people whose lives and livelihoods are connected with this system as we, as, as we are at the moment. And, so that, and, and that basically means just transition because we have, we have a very powerful organised section of people. It's called the trade union movement. We have to be able to bring them on board. To be able to bring them on board, you need to be able to talk about just transition. Not just about all these, no energy, no dirty energy. What about the people connected to the energy systems? We have to be able to tell we, we know. I, I was, you know, a teenager in thought board. I've finished. I've finished. <laughs> <laughs> I've finished. <laughs> and on my wall, I've still got a poster saying, no coal. You know, it's coal, not coal. I, I fought in the, in the climate strike, you know, and I really re recognize what the devastation that happened to those miners to be and we need to be able to offer a solution in terms of that. So, the so I'm going to deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not about dealing with it. It's called talking not about dealing with it. There is movement building happening. It's incredible movement building happening. This is what great movement building, what power shift is about, in terms of example, about training, about sharing experience and skills across the world. But there are some incredible things happening. There is reclaimed power, not the reclaimed, but our reclaimed power, which is an attempt to bring together all global movements fighting around dirty energy in a week of action for everyone out of fight, to connect people, to make people realize when you're fighting in Baltimore, the Philippines, or India, or China, or, or in the US, you're actually connected in terms of skills. That's what global events, what global events mean. We've got global campaigns that bring in from the global south, because again in Copenhagen, with a real mistake, it was northern people marching, the rest of the south wasn't at all visible or engaged. That's where we're living for. We have got real networks of movement. You'll hear a lot about them. This fight, you know, as people always say, it's a big fight. Of course, it's a fight for our lives. But this fight for our lives is not going to be won and fought. And it's a big sort of strike target. Anybody who thinks that we're talking about a two year time frame or a three year time frame, again, is going to be, it's, it's replicating all the mistakes we made in terms of Copenhagen, which is like a crashing of movement as well. So we have to see Paris as an important battlefield for us, an important moment for us to be able to force our issues, but we have to take our movement through it, and we have to recognise that we're not going to be able to win until we win at the local level, the national, but also the global level. So I'm really happy to be part of all this, but we are the movement, and I really am confident, I'm an optimist, but I'm confident, that the power that we have is always greater than the power that they have. We just don't know how much power.